Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Doug Smith from Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative. Um, today we're going to be looking at the PBIS 6 classroom practices. This is going to be a brief, quick overview of those practices. And uh, so let's go ahead and rock and roll. First thing I need you to do is in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll see a small QR code. If you could just uh, hover over that with your cell phone, uh, the camera, it should take you to a website that you can uh, log in and uh, uh, register and, or say that you were here. Please do that right now. Also, mute your microphones while you're not speaking. We pick up a lot of background noise, as I've, I've been told that we pick up background noise here. So just uh, mute your microphones, please. Use the Zoom's chat function, if at all possible, if you have a question or a comment. I think about your actions. We are on camera. Uh, it's being recorded, and uh, so I have to think about my actions as well. And be attentive. Uh, and uh, thank you. Is everyone signed in? I'll give you about another 30 seconds or so. And if you have difficulty signing in, just uh, put in the chat, and uh, we'll have someone take care of that. All right, thank you. So the agenda for today is briefly going to explain or talk about each uh, uh, class, or each practice for the classroom. We're going to be looking at the physical environment, classroom teaching matrix, active supervision, encouraging appropriate behavior using a continuum of responses for inappropriate behaviors and engagement opportunities to respond. These six classroom practices, when put into place, are the research has shown that they have a positive impact on students. Uh, the goal is to use these uh, practices consistently by everyone. And uh, so these strategies help maximize classroom supports to allow for increased academic uh, and instructional time and reduce teacher and student stress. And we all need those stress relievers. So the first thing we're going to look at is uh, Good classroom management is linked with the following things. I'm not going to read those to you. You can read those. But the one thing that you want to remember is strong classroom practices or strong classroom management signals that to kids that class is safe. And uh, also that well-managed classrooms are rated as having a more positive climates. So uh, it is our kids come to us from a lot of difficult situations and uh, when a, if you remember it and look at Maslow's hierarchy, the first thing that you must need for those kids are those physiological needs, you know, food, water, shelter, and then safety and belonging, and then uh, love and support. So the safety is a very key thing. And a, a well-managed classroom does uh, let them know that it is a safe place to learn. So the physical environment, when we're looking at arranging the physical environment, we're looking at you know, how is basically what it says, how's the classroom arranged? Uh, can all the students see, see you? Can they hear you? Can you see all the students? Are they easily a, a, able to move about the classroom? Uh, you know, arrange your classroom in ways that you can see and get to the students uh, and have special seating if possible uh, for the students that need that for less uh, strenuous, less stimulus. You may have a special seating assignment also, you may want you may want to come up with a seating arrangement, uh, not the kids, uh, because we know what can happen with those situations. A lot of times, I let my kids come up with their own state seating chart, and there would be a couple of the kids that nobody wanted to sit with, and so you know you got to be able to group those kids accordingly, as academically as well as uh, just being friends and showing compassion. So, effective arrangement of the physical environment. Increases on task behavior, of course, uh, increases the perception of safety and it makes it easier for the kids to see the curriculum visuals and also it makes it easier for active supervision on the teacher's part so that you're able to kind of uh, move around and, and talk to kids and show interest and concern and be able to provide the, the students that you have the support that they need when they show you that they have support or that they need that support. So classroom teaching matrix, this is not really an actual practice, but it is a critical way of teaching the rules, expectations, routines, procedures, whatever you want to call them in your classroom. 
and it looks at, you take into account anything that you may have to have a routine for. It could be as, as simple as hanging their coats up when they come into the class in the morning, where to find an extra pencil if they need one, where to put their homework when they're completed, uh, where to look to find if they have missed an assignment, how they can make that assignment up. Those could be simple routines. Uh, also, when you look at these, uh, setting the, the rationale is when you're setting up the rules and procedures, make sure you teach those to the kids. You know, just having a poster on the wall with their rules or expectations doesn't mean that they know what's going on or what they're talking about. So you have to teach those rules and expectations. You'll have to model those for the students, show them what you want and the beha behaviors that you want to see. And then you also have to practice those with the kids give them corrective, positive corrective feedback on uh, the rules and the routines. And then you also have to remind them several times. You know, the first couple of weeks of school, you may have to remind them every day of what the rules or expectations are or what the routines are, such as walking down the hallway, such as, you know, uh, uh, just coming into the classroom. Whatever you have a routine for, you have to teach it to the kids and remind them. And then after extended periods of break, you'll have to remind them as well. Say for instance, if we have a, a fall break and you get three or four or five days off in a row when they come back, you want to review and reteach your rules and expectations and routines to the students. And that just helps them get back on track and helps you get back, back on track as well. So active supervision is a proactive practice of moving around continu continuously scanning all areas of the setting. And then active supervision means that you just what it says you're actively moving you're looking you're watching you're listening and uh you know a lot of times we walk down the hallway we take the same path every time the little fellow sits there and he watches you every day he knows exactly where you're going or she knows exactly where you're going to walk and how you're going to interact with students so they know the places that you won't be looking make sure that you change your path up every now and then that way it keeps them off guard and plus it lets you see and listen to more of the kids I use a proximity prompt, just move closer to students when you think that there could be a situation coming up. Our eye contact, smiles, you know, our kids love it when you smile at them. And then also just have a pleasant voice tone and just interact with the kids, show them that you care and that you're concerned about them and that, that you have some, same, you know, find out what they're interested in so you have something to talk to them about. And so use the students' names as well. You know, when I, I worked at a, a small school and the kids would get off the bus every morning and we'd meet them as they got off the bus. Good morning, how you doing? And call them by name. Well, they walked into the front door of the building. Someone was at the, in the foyer there, uh, called the same thing, spoke to them, said, good morning, glad to see you, have a great day. And as they went down the hallway, all the teachers were outside their classrooms, standing by the doors, just welcome, welcoming the students, calling them by names, giving them high fives, making just casual conversations. And so the kids felt really comfortable and safe in that environment. And uh, we you know, didn't take care of all uh, behavior problems, but we had less behavior problems just because the kids felt that the climate and the culture of the school was a caring and, and trusting one. So just built that relationship and relationship building goes a long way when working with students. So the next thing we wanna do is look at encouraging appropriate behaviors. And this is just a set of strategies that you use to encourage students to be, uh, have better positive interactions and behaviors. Uh, so communication, uh, giving specific feedback, motivating students with reinforcers. And then some of these things that we look at, teach behavior and routines, we already talked about that, but you would want a written plan or a schedule that you would use to teach those behaviors and those routines. Uh, preventative prompts are just basically what it says. You're preventing uh, unexpected behaviors by using prompts. You know, my guys, when they'd leave the classroom, I'd remind them of the classroom procedures. Right hand side in the hall, you know, hands to yourself, walk quietly, thank you, have a great day. And you can remind them of those procedures easily uh, in less than 10 seconds. And it doesn't take that much. It's just part of the day and part of your routine. Behavior specific praise is basically what it says. You look at the student and you praise them for the specific behavior that you saw. You know, everybody did a good job, it's not really behavior specific praise because I could have sat back in the back of the room, had my feet propped up on my desk, my hoodie up over my head and asleep. Now, is that doing a good job? I don't think so. So, you know, Doug 
Very nice job listening, paying attention to the speaker. You made eye contact that showed respect. That behavior specific praise allows them to uh, know what uh, you are praising them and what that behavior that you are praising is so that they can use that behavior again. Individual reinforcers are basically what it says. If you have a token economy in your classroom or a way that kids can earn points toward a reward at the end of the day or at the end of the week, then uh, you know, find something that reinforces that individual. What reinforces one student may not reinforce the other student. So it has to be, be individually uh, individualized for that student because what I'll work for, someone else may not work for. And then use group contingencies as well. And, and that's based on if the whole group does a good job or the whole class does a good job for the week, then you get something at the end of a predetermined time. I would always use like a popcorn party or something. If all my guys made their individual uh, school points for the week, then we would have a popcorn party. It would, you know, last 30 minutes of the day on Friday. Uh, so it was usually when they had their uh, PE time anyway. So if we'd have a popcorn party, that was, that was all part of it. But they all worked together and they all helped and reinforced and supported each other to earn that group contingency. It wasn't based on just one individual. So continuum of responses for inappropriate behaviors is you start with the least restrictive or least intrusive intensive uh, support that you need and move to the most intensive supports. If uh, basically uh, eye contact or signal will calm a situation down or just proximity, then that's what you'll start with. Then after those nonverbal uh, prompts, then you would move into more verbal prompts, calling the student by name, uh, maybe uh, showing concern, asking questions, you know, uh, just things like that. And then you move uh, to more restrictive from there. So I always start with the least restrictive and to move to a more restrictive uh, uh, strategies. And basically what I'm saying is you have a toolkit of respectful strategies that diminish frequency, intensity, and duration of inappropriate behaviors. Uh, continuum is necessary because what works for one person, like we always said with reinforcers, may not work for everyone. So have different things that you can use, have different tools in your toolbox that you can use to uh, direct or, or refocus attention and provide the support that those students need. So engagement and opportunities to respond, these are several different things that you can use. So basically the more opportunities you give the kids to respond and engage in the classwork or in the uh, curriculum that's and the instruction that's going on, the less time you'll have for behavior problems. So just keep them busy, but keep them busy with uh, constructive, uh, positive, appropriate feedback and corrective feedback as well. That was the word I was looking for instead of constructive. Corrective feedback. Uh, so the higher rates of uh, opportunities to respond during re instruction, results increases in ac academic responses and desired behaviors and increases undesired behaviors. And give them different ways to respond as well. You know, they could use a thumbs up or a thumbs down if they don't understand something. Could use a whiteboard to write answers on uh, and hold up all at the same time. Uh, you know, just whatever, uh, some, some creative ways that, that you can have your students respond. We uh, had a couple of math classes there and one of the instructors that I worked with, the teacher, he would get up and we were learning about slope and angle and, and, uh, and he would get up and he'd have the students get up and be able to show with their arms what a, an acute angle was, what an obtuse angle was, straight angle. Uh, so that was pretty interesting because the kids that didn't really have the uh, capabilities of the paper and pencil task, they could stand up and show you that thing, that stuff. So it let them a way to, you know, be able to uh, interact with the classroom and it gave them an opportunity to respond in a way that was uh, a little differently. And, and they learned it a little bit easier and it stuck with them a little bit longer. So one thing that you got to think about is to change behavior, we need to step back and create more long-term campaigns and provide continuous opportunities for practice. This doesn't only apply to the students, but it applies to you as well as the teachers and as the educators. And one thing that when I was uh, first started teaching, there, there was a comment that was made that you don't change the student, you change your uh, approach to the student. Just like that we can't change a test for a student, 
or the material, but we can change the way we present that materials for the students. The same thing goes with behavior. You can't change that student, but you can change how you respond to that behavior. And hopefully that response changes that student's behavior to a more appropriate one. So some resources that we have available are uh, COVID-19 at the Holler, and then COVID-19, the Kentucky Dose Support Network. Then we have Kentucky Academic and Behavioral Response to Intervention, which is Avery. And this bottom link takes you to a, a site where there's uh, several different uh, resources available. Uh, they've not all been vetted, of course, but there's some good resources available there. Let's see if I can go to the Holler one. This is where most of our information is housed, our trainings and websites. And so, yes, yeah, so if we can scroll down, am I making you dizzy? So special education courses, uh, special education PD, uh, special education manipulatives. This is a real good resource for uh, home and for parents. Uh, so there are just several different uh, resources and opportunities there. Let's see. Uh, so if you wanted to do, needed some virtual, uh, you needed some PD hours, you could go and do some of these. Uh, all you gotta do is click on view the form, then it'll come up, we'll click on, I don't know. Uh, of course we'll click on mine, what am I talking about? I don't know. And then uh, and fill out this form and then after you get this completed, uh, go to the next page. And then on the next page, uh, it won't let me, but on the next page is a short video that you'll watch. And then after you're through viewing the short video, then you can go and uh, uh, take a little quiz and, and it should give you a uh, certificate of completion and uh, give you your score on that certificate. And uh, that's uh, some resources that are available out there for you. Thank you, I'm Doug Smith. Uh, if I can be of any assistance or help at all, I know I went through this rather quick. I get nervous to talk fast, so y'all got the short and sweet version. But my email is doug.smith at hazard.kyschools.us. Just reach out, give me a yell, give me a shout, uh, send me an email, and I'll, I'll help you folks as much as I can. Thank you all. Have a great evening.